because General Electric was there doing a uh, shroud replacement job. And they had just finished that job when the earthquake happened. Wow. They were running out of that plant. <laughs> they were staying in some hotel down the road in a town called Tomioka. And they took off to higher ground to a place called the Liberal Hotel where there's a golf course. <laughs> higher ground. They stayed in their cars overnight. <clears throat> of course, General Electric has never spoken, talked about it at all. None of the workers a lot to talk about it, but I have a lot of inside connections still with, you know, with GE and people that I know work for GE and whatnot. And they ended up the next day uh, going back and driving as far as they could towards Tokyo through whatever roads, because the roads they're all in bad shape. They're cracked all over the place, one waves, you know, all over the place. And when they ran out of gas, uh, the head. Uh, GE's corporate office in Tokyo sent out a bus and picked up all the workers and got them out of the country and of course GE has never talked about you know, any of that. Unit 4 <laughs> is probably the one that's in the most shaky condition right now for a future problem. That's right. Because uh, you know, it's got all of, it's got more fuel than the spent fuel pool than any other plant there. That's uh, right. And it's uh, if they were hit by another 9.0 earthquake, why the whole thing could go down. That would be a catastrophe. Okay. <clears throat> yes. Okay. Um, I have a bit of a long question. Bear with okay. me. Um, what would it take to make PG&E and Southern California Edison dismantle San Onofre and Diablo Canyon before an earthquake creates Fukushima in California? Um, where could they put the radioactive materials from the plants? And if they don't dismantle it, what are their plans for the people and the croplands and the oceans of California in the, in the event of a rapid disassembly event? <laughs> Let's separate the two plants, okay. okay. Southern Cal Edison and San Diego with the Piasco Electric. And a little bit of a piece of the city of Riverside on Southern, uh, San Onofre. Uh, pg e owns basically all the damn okay. Okay, what are their plans? I have no idea what their plans are uh, other than to try and operate as long as they can and make as much money as they can. Uh, yeah. let's, go, let's go to San Onofre right now. San Onofre is uh, a two-unit combustion engineering plant. Basically, each unit is approximately 1,100 megawatts electric. Uh, neither one of those units has operated since January of 2012. They've both been down for more than a year. Right now, Southern Cal Edison has requested permission from the NRC to operate Unit 2 at not to exceed 70% of rated power. Uh, unit 3 remains somewhere in limbo. I, uh, you know, they haven't made any requests on Unit 3, and Unit 3 isn't even talked about, at least publicly. The reason for the, the problem at San Diego is that all four of the steam generators, which is a big heat, heat exchanger, in the reactor building uh, were replaced either two or three years ago with units built by Mitsubishi Heavy Industries. Uh, Southern Cal Edison got approval from the Public Utilities Commission, which is how, you know, which is right up the road here, uh, to add $850 million for the replacement job to their rate base, and they're making uh, their the rate payers. yeah, and the ratepayers are paying for that right now. There is a law in the state of California, or with, within the PUC, that plant equipment has to be used and useful in order for the utility to make any get a return on that investment. There's a very good question in 
uh, well, I don't think there's even a question, but it seems to me that that plant is not used and useful now. And there is uh, supposedly a six month window on that. So uh, the PUC could, uh, could tell them that, you know, forget about it. Uh, you're not going to get any money back on that. And I think that's why Southern Cal Edison is wanting to operate at this 70% limit. At least they can make a, some kind of an argument that a portion of it is used and useful. The Abel Canyon, uh, of course, is also a two-unit plant. Uh, <coughs> Westinghouse unit has uh, steam generators that have been replaced also at uh, some significant cost. The way that PG&E is uh, being paid for the plant operation is somewhat different. They reached an agreement with the PUC, and I don't remember the details of it. But they are wanting, both San Onofre and the Evelyn Canyon have requested a, uh, an extension to the plant operating license. Uh, their operating license uh, is uh, due to expire within the next two or three years. And they've asked for uh, a three-year extension. Uh, it hasn't been acted on yet by the NRC. If the NRC approves it, of course, they will continue to try to operate. Now, I don't, San Nofre is a, you know, is a, a big question mark because things, the steam generators fell apart after less than two years of operation. So whether they will ask the PUC for approval to replace them, I don't know. Uh, there are a lot of different politics involved because uh, some of the people that I know have been trying to get uh, to pressure the, uh, the state government and, and, uh, and Southern Cal Edison and company to convert that plant, portions of that plant, maybe to a gas fired plant and scrap the nuclear side. Uh, that's a very, in my opinion, that's very desirable except for one thing, and that is that the state of California has this uh, goal of achieving a significant portion of power generation by alternative energy, non, not non-carbon producing uh, plants. And so I don't know what's going to happen. I mean, one, one of the issues that I think has been raised uh, in the past in the United States, and I didn't bring it up earlier, is that workers, whistleblowers in the industry have been retaliated against, have been blackballed, have been lost their jobs. Not one executive or manager has gone to jail. Mm -hmm. Now think about that. Mm -hmm. You have tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of workers in the industry, in the nuclear industry. and. You have a, a history, and particularly San Onofre, from what I understand, is the highest level of safety co safety complaints. San Onofre nuclear plant. You've had whistleblowers at many of these plants, all over the country, who've issued concerns, who've written reports uh, about health and safety problems, and then as a result of that, they've been retaliating. They've been fired. They've lost their jobs, and also they've been prevented from even getting jobs in other utilities. So in other words, PG&E has a sensor list, or a, a blacklist, that if you're a whistleblower here, you can't go anywhere else in the industry. Even in another country. Even in like another country. I mean, they follow people. The they follow people. Mm -hmm. Despite that clear violation of the law, clear retaliation and conspiracy, it's really conspiracy to violate the law, there's been no jailing, there's no imprisonment of any of these managers or executives. So they maybe get a pat in the hand, and business as usual. How can you protect the whistleblowers when there's no criminal penalties for retaliating against a whistleblower? That is something that has never been addressed. I've watched the NRC. They had a debate on Fukushima. Your name didn't come up, Kate. should have, about what happened at Fukushima. But the fact of the matter is the whistleblowers, like Kay and others, who have been putting their careers on the line, their lives on the line, and it was a result of the retaliation. That issue hasn't come up at the NRC. They don't talk about the whistleblowers. They don't talk about the workers who are trying to keep these plants safe. 
whether you agree or disagree with nuclear power. Whether it's even operating or not operating, they still have to be protected. They still have to be taken care of. So this issue, and this is one of the reasons we're having this conference, is to say that there has to be accountability and transparency, and there has to be criminal, in my view, there have to be criminal penalties against managers and executives that retaliate against whistleblowers. Mm -hmm. This is not acceptable. It's a criminal act that puts not only the workers in danger, but puts the entire public and community in danger. And the fact that the San Onofre executive, Southern California Edison, actually covered up documents which said there was a danger because of the, of the, of the pipes, uh, fluidity of the pipes breaking, that there was a danger in the design, and they covered this up. I believe there needs to be criminal action against Southern California Edison. These executives should go to jail for that because they were withholding from the National uh, Nuclear Regulatory Commission the fact that there were serious systemic safety problems, and they kept that document a secret. They didn't let people know about it. Well, if you or I did something of a criminal nature, <laughs> you can be sure that we would be arrested and thrown in jail. But because it's the utility, and because the utility runs the PUC through Michael Peavy, uh, and Jerry Brown allows the utility to run the PUC, there's no accountability, there's no action. And this is a systemic problem, not just here, it's in Japan. I mean, I don't think one executive who's gone to jail in Japan uh, for uh, the mismanagement, for the dangers. I mean, the, the people aren't held accountable. So if you never go to jail, if all you do is get a pat in the hand on the wrist for violating the law, there's no incentive really for these executives and managers to say, well, I better not do that. In, in fact, when uh, <coughs> Kay was ordered to uh, edit the, the videotape, uh, and he didn't want to do it, but it's a crime to do that in the United States. It's a felony to edit a, t a safety tape at a nuclear facility, but it's happening because people are afraid of losing their jobs and the industry really controls things. Dan? Yeah, well, we'll talk, I'll talk about this briefly later in a different field, biotech, but what, hap what happens is these entities like PGE or, or Pfizer, you name it, they can reach into the government agencies and, you know, harass people, and I'll talk about this a little bit, but uh, there's one woman who actually beat by uh, in a lawsuit and is actually going to collect something after 10, 10 years of struggle, her and her husband. She, <laughs> Pfizer reached into the FDA and started destroying the career of her husband uh -huh. because she, one reason she could survive was because he had what they call a good job, you know, making a lot of, a decent amount of money for a government person and he, he did very important work and so, you know, that, 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 it, it happened, that those kind of things happen, and, and it's not, that, that's how the system maintains itself, and you have to fight it. She's fought it, but she's been able to fight it because her husband stood by her. And, and, that, and that's the wives and the, and the you know, the, the, the families. I mean, it's not just the workers themselves, they're families. Yeah. Families are destroyed. People lose their homes, they lose their families. I'm sure people have committed suicide. Uh, because of what happens. Why should you be put in this situation? Uh, this whole thing of, of nuclear safety and, and whistleblowers is a, a life and death question. A life and death question. And the fact that this has not been raised in the NRC, this has not been raised in California at OSHA, and we were going to have on Dr. Larry Rose, is a serious question. Workers are putting their lives on the line to protect the health and safety of their workers and the community. and Nothing happens when they're retaliated against. Why? We have to ask why. Why is that? And as, as uh, Dan. Dan said, because the government is controlled by the utilities. The government is controlled by the industry, mm -hmm. and they don't want to prosecute and put these executives in jail. You know, you've heard the quote, too big to fail? Yeah. The banks? Yeah. You know, the banks steal. <laughs> they take our money. Mm -hmm. And we can't prosecute because they're too big? This is what Eric Holder said. He said that he actually said in yeah. his language, we cannot prosecute the banks for criminal activity. Now when the government says you cannot prosecute a company because of criminal activity, what does that tell the people in this country? That you are above the law. That you are above the law. You are not accountable and you're not responsible for what you do. And what it does and what it does in the industry, obviously, is that they say, we don't care. Mm -hmm. We don't care. 
We can do what we want. And they have their right. They can do what they want because they're not held accountable. That's, I think, the lesson of, of this experience of whistleblowers who have spoken out and tried to protect the public. So uh, we have to uh, wrap this section of the uh, meeting up. I do want to put on um, uh, Dr. Larry Rose, who was a whistleblower at Cal OSHA, who actually was whistleblowing about the lack of doctors and health uh, uh, inspectors in California. There are only 162 OSHA inspectors in California. Cal OSHA. Cal OSHA. 162 inspectors in Cal OSHA for 18 million workers. There are only, I think, 180 inspectors in the United States of OSHA inspecting these plants, and from what I understand, only two of them are knowledgeable about the nuclear industry. So what does that mean? What it means is, is that you have to take the word of the utility. That's what it means. It means when you go to a plant, uh, you are not capable of really doing a, an investigation and finding out exactly what's going on. But this is not, I think, just an issue with nuclear plants. We have Chevron, the Richmond refinery, Right. where I don't know if, if people saw the article in the Chronicle, but they have violated the law. They have conspired to violate the law. They have not been properly supervised. Cal OSHA uh, has not ins properly inspected that plant. And, you know, we talk about knowing what's happening at the nuclear plants, uh, the radiation that's being released, uh, the monitoring. Well, you know, I did a, a, a little op-ed piece on KPFA. You know, we put a space vehicle, the Curiosity, into Mars yeah. Yeah. To, to understand exactly what the atmosphere of Mars is and the chemicals, we can't do the same thing at the Chevron refinery? <laughs> Think about that. Yeah. I mean, we can know what's going on in Mars, but we can't know what's going on in the Chevron refinery. We can't know what's going on at these nuclear plants, like in San Onofre. I mean, there is a serious systemic problem. So let me put on Larry Rose briefly. Yeah. Could, could I, while we still have these engineers up, could I have one last question? There, uh, because we uh, all agree that uh, the spent fuel pool on, nucle on uh, Unit 4 is very dangerous, there has been a proposal to fill the building with earth or foam to stabilize the fuel pool in case of another earthquake. Do you think that's feasible, or is there something that um, you'd have to tunnel through? Do, do they need access to this thing that is, and is the trade-off of access to um, actually stabilizing that fuel pool worth it? <clears throat> no, I, I have I've seen just a, a few uh, suggestions of that. I and mean, I think, uh, as you said, they're talking about the possibility of filling in the area underneath the spent fuel pool with gravel or something like that, so that if you had another uh, major earthquake, the whole thing would not collapse. Uh, I'm not really in favor of it. I think the, the I think it's more. In, I think the best thing to do is get that fuel out of there as soon as possible. But it is a trade-off, of course. It's a trade-off, and you, you're betting about uh, whether there's going to be a major earthquake in the next three years or so, however long it's going to take to get the stuff out of there. Uh, or not. So, but, you know, the thing that uh, you can maybe uh, learn a little bit from Chernobyl, you know, the Russians came in there and dumped tons, you know, thousands of tons of stuff on top of that thing. And it's a god awful mess. Uh, and it's going to be there a long time. And if you put in uh, all that gravel or other material to stabilize the thing, Eventually, you're going to have to get rid of it somehow. It's not going to make the spent fuel pool leak proof. It's just going to keep it from totally collapsing. I don't know. I, you no, I, I agree with that too, yeah. And I agree with you what you're saying. They got to get the fuel out of there. I mean, they should try to stabilize it because maybe the next big quake, that whole building, the fuel pool might collapse. That would be terrible. So, the right, best thing to do is get that fuel out of there. But how are they going to do it? <laughs> How are they going to move it into tasks? A couple of questions. Okay. I'd like to ask a related question. Uh, uh, maybe you know better, Kay. Is are they working in like three shifts, 24 hours a day, to build this superstructure around the building? Or I, is, is it I'm, not, I'm not. I'm not 
up to par to that. I do know that area is controlled. You can't get in there without special permits, and you have to have you know, permits to get in there. And the workers, uh, they've taken, there's a huge soccer field not too far away, and they have taken that over as their central area of command. And from there, they the workers go and uh, work out there. I'm, I'm, I'd love to walk on site and actually see uh -huh. that little bit. I don't think they would let me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just thinking they're, they're going to start in a year if they're working around the clock. Maybe they can start. They probably are working around the clock. I wouldn't. I wouldn't yeah. doubt it. They they work around the clock. And nuke plants are is a is a 24 hour job. Wow. Yeah, I've worked many shifts. Uh, we hosted uh, Yastel Yamada of the Skilled Veterans Corps of Fukushima. He came over here a couple times to talk about the situation. And he said that the elderly workers that have volunteered to go in there can't go in because of the management structure of TEPCO, which is subcontracted and subcontracted and subcontracted, so that there is no overall hiring policy. Would you comment on that? That's probably true, yeah. They hire, you know, they hire the Yakuza, I'm sure, too, to do a lot of that work. And a lot of times they have the older people working because they can take more exposure. Yeah, he, he said that they have no overall management, no project management for the whole situation there. I, I wouldn't doubt that. I, I'm not privy to how that, you know, how the labor force is handled for Fukushima's... Well, one of the things is, look, let's be clear about it. The Japanese government is running TEPCO now. Mm -hmm. The Japanese government. It's not TEPCO, it's Japanese government. The Japanese government is saying that they want to restart the nuclear plants in Japan. Despite this. So this idea that, you know, they, they, they want to clean it up and, and make it better is bogus. The Japanese government is directly in charge of Fukushima. And they're saying it can be decontaminated, people can move back to Fukushima, and we want to restart all the other nuclear plants in Japan. This is what they're saying to people. This, is, this raises the question of, you know, and our U.S. government is backing them and telling them to do this. The U.S. government, Obama administration. So this is what we're talking about. They. What can we do about it? Yeah. Well, the question of what can you do, we're going to have a discussion at this conference. But the fact is, the U.S. government is now uh, providing tax subsidies and wants Babcock and Wilcox, which was just mentioned, to build modular nuclear reactors that can be moved yeah, around. Yeah. I mean, they're actually spending our tax dollars to build small modular nuclear reactors that can be moved around, and they're, they're more efficient, they say, you know, as far as nuclear power. I mean, this is, I can't, you can't make this up. So the government, the politicians, our representatives, we have to say to them, why are you allowing this? I mean, Ron Wyden went to uh, Fukushima, yes. Senator Ron Wyden. And he saw that it was a danger if there was another earthquake. He saw that they weren't having, they were having a serious problem, you know, controlling the situation. And he came back and wrote letters to all the government agencies and said, what, what, what are you doing about this? What are you going to do about this? Well, the response of the government, of Secretary of State Clinton, was to go to Japan and tell them to continue to start to restart the nuclear program. So Obama, the Obama administration, the government officials are controlled at this point by the nuclear industry, but it's the same in California. Let me, let me. It's the same in California. Look, G Governor Brown controls the Public Utility Commission. He makes the appointments. You have the chair of the Public Utility Commission, Michael Peavy, who takes money, who's former chief executive of Southern California Edison, and takes money from these utilities to go on, on, on trips. Now. He takes, he, so you have a situation in which the governor of California is supporting a corrupt chairman of the California Public Utility Commission that is forcing the people of California, to, the ratepayer, to pay for a plant that's not even operating. We, why are we paying for a plant that's not operating and, in fact, is never going to operate because of the serious systemic problems because it's broken? The, these are corruption. It's political corruption. It's a cover-up by government agencies. OSHA, why has nobody gone to jail for retaliating? Because they don't, they're not, in California, why aren't they prosecuting Chevron executives who knew what was going on? Mm -hmm. 
People have to demand that. People have to demand their representatives say, why aren't you enforcing law? This is all we're talking about. Enforce the law. There are laws on the books that say you can't do these things. They're doing them and they're not even being prosecuted. So it's not just in Washington, it's right here in California. So we have to get down to the nitty gritty where we are. Get down. Just a quickie. Just a, this is one of those amusing stories. This is Dan Berman who's uh, written the book Death on the yeah, Job. I, that was so many years ago. But it's a very good book. Death on the Job, and you can get it on Amazon for, for very low, but it's a good book. Yeah, well, you can get an expensive one too if you want. You can get an expensive one too. But here's what, now Michael Peavy is someone I've been kind of watching, because a friend of mine used to work for him back around, you know, in the mid-70s. He, he used to be the research director of something called the uh, California State Labor Federation, and he got a, a master's in, in economics at UC Berkeley. And they, you know, probably twice as bright as all of us put together. But anyway, what he did is, he used to have an office on uh, the 8th and then I think the 13th floor of the old PG&E building down on Market Street. And uh, he, he, um, he set up a thing called California Council for Environmental and Economic Balance sometime in the, in the early 70s. That was about a two or three million dollar operation. And what the, what, they, what the main thing, the big thing they wanted to do was to, was to push, uh, was to fight against, the first big operation was fighting against Prop 15, which someone may remember from 75 or 76, people that are better informed than I am which would make it illegal to build any new nukes if you couldn't figure out what to do with, with the waste. Well, Ralph Nader was running up and down the, uh, run up, up and down the, up and down the state, and, and uh, uh, Grossman, what, what's his first name? Richard Grossman was running up and down the state, and Harvey Wasserman, some people that, you know, it, 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 anyway, so the thing got uh, only 49% of the vote, so it lost, but after that, people knew you could never, permit a new nuke in it. Now, on his, in his office, because, you know, I used to visit his office, because there's a lot of copying I got done there, uh, <laughs> later, in the evening, but, and I shouldn't say that, but anyway, <laughs> I, that's just a joke. <laughs> but anyway, 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 um, what happened was, he had, a, he had a cartoon behind his desk that he had blown up, and it was him doing a write-up, a cut to Ralph Nader on Prop 15. It was right in his office. And so then he went on to, he was picked up by Edison. He became the president of Southern California Edison, which is the utility, which is uh, uh, totally owned by, it used to be SCE Corp. Now it's Edison International. When he didn't become the president of Edison International because I don't know, he didn't, hadn't gone to Yale or something, or, or Stanford, like the guy who got it. He went and he went and he got into involved in some gas, some gas ventures, and then they put him in as head of this. But he's always been kind of a fan of, you know, noobs, and he spreads the money. Of it. I, when they were about to shut down the labor center, it, 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 I don't know if this is true, someone should corroborate it, but at the UC Berkeley, he came up, he helped, you know, raise a, few, a million or two to kind of keep it going, two or three years ago. It, he, you know, he keeps his fingers in the different pies. What are you going to do? I mean, that's, that's what he, but it's an inside job. The whole thing is an inside that's, that's, job. I mean, the Guardian, I'm saying. there are many arguments about Michael exactly. Peavy, but what can you do? These people are representing us. Mm -hmm. These people are our representatives. I mean, it's, it's, they're our representatives. They're appointed by the governor. They represent us, and they're doing what they're doing. And it's the same in Japan. The Japanese people. The Japanese people have been demonstrating in the tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands since Fukushima. No more nuclear plants. I mean, when I was there, they, every Friday, yeah. thousands of them are in front of the Prime Minister's house. Please don't restart the plants. Please evacuate the children. The government is saying, basically, to hell with you. To hell with you. So when the government says to the people, we're going to ignore you, we don't care what you think, the, for the people in San Onofre, we got a question from, from Stone, I haven't seen the question, but, you know, how can you, how can Southern California Edison, and they also said they were going to lay off 50% of the workers. This is another thing they did. At the, they put a notice out, they're going to lay off 50% of the workers at San Onofre, and they're going to restart the plant. 
Now, how do you lay off 50% of the workers and then say you're going to restock the plant? It's the most dangerous, plant. It's the most dangerous yeah. plant in the country? Mm -hmm. I mean, they obviously have contempt for the people in San Onofre, the people in California, to even say something like that. But that's their attitude. Their attitude is, we can say whatever we want, we can do whatever we want, and there's no accountability. Barbara, we're going to have to break up for lunch. But you were going to say they something? They actually... Um, had the plan to fire the 750 workers before the problem started at, at San Onofre. So they were already planning on getting rid of their of their workforce. And it's, it's very interesting because the um, Edison apparently was negotiating with Entergy two or three years ago to sell the plant. Um, and Explain to what that's a big nuclear. Entergy is a former Louisiana utility that has um, gone in for bottom feeding and buying up old nuclear <laughs> power plants. So Entergy, um, and it's interesting that Edison was was doing these negotiations, especially now that we know what you know what, what serious problems they they already knew they were having at the plant. Um, but I happened to go to a um, an event at the CPUC, they have something called the Thought Leaders every once in a while. Uh, <laughs> and uh, and uh, this is so particular event was the Haas, it was a Haas business school at Berkeley. And one of the professors and a couple of graduate students had done some studies on nuclear power plants, like which ones are more efficient and of course being the Haas Business School it was the you know it was the ones that were owned by merchant generators in other words they they were not owned by utilities anymore and and you know my guess is that they were more efficient I and mean, supposedly they ran more safely too but it's like well yeah no uh, um, you know, not even the, the, the slight amount of, uh, of oversight that you have for a utility, so they just kept everybody really quiet. Uh, but anyway, Haas, you know, this was their claim was that, you know, you're, you're better off with nukes that are run by something like Entergy. So I thought this looked to me like a, you know, kind of a coordinated operation. I have no idea if it was, but there's, um, I, I've been really, I've been warning people that we should, we need to keep in mind that Edison had this plan because if if Entergy had bought the plant, uh, we would have even less um, authority in California over them than we do over Edison. Uh, if people may know about Vermont and Yankee, which is uh, the whole state legislature and the governor are opposed to Vermont Yankee. Um, but they can't get it shut down. And Entergy owns, and Entergy owns Indian Point, which is 35 miles north of. Yeah, I mean that's that's it. I mean you have nuclear plants 35 miles from New York City. That if there was a meltdown, if there was a disaster there, what would happen to New York City? And they keep the plant going. They, you know, this is like, and people, and all over this country, we're going to be commemorating the anniversary of Fukushima, but all over this country, people are fighting to shut down these plants. They're dated, they're old, the pipes are breaking. I mean, these plants are, are, are really, uh, are dangerous, they're leaking. There is leaking, leaking uh, radioactive material in the rivers in the United States. All over the country, in the rivers and oceans, it's a radioactive mess. Hanford is leaking in Washington. There's a radioactive contamination of the people of the United States all the time. In fact, in this recent drought, uh, these plants, they had to shut them down because they didn't have enough water to cool them. Well, these rivers that they cool the plants in, they're leaking. They, they have records that they're leaking, the Columbia River. But th this is no emergency. It's not presented as an emergency. It's business as usual, despite the fact that our health and safety, our environment is being threatened for life. I mean, people want to know, there's a cancer epidemic in this country? Right. Mm -hmm. Women, men, there's a cancer epidemic? Oh. Well, what causes cancer epidemics? Why aren't there studies? You know, you ask in San Onofre, for the people of San Onofre, why aren't there any studies of the people of San Onofre, the communities in San Onofre, or around these plants who are getting cancer? You would think that that would be a natural. No. It isn't because they don't want the liability of who's going to pay for these people. 
But it's again, it's not just nuclear plant. Chevron, there's an epidemic of asthma and cancer near the Chevron plant. Is there a survey? Are there statistics on the liability? Who's getting cancer? The children, 50% of the children have, have asthma. In, in going to school in, in, Chef, in, in Richmond. You know, these are serious questions of health and safety of the workers in the communities. So we are now going to take a break and we have a lunch and also we have a film which is going to be premiering for the first time in the world. <laughs> it's a rough cut. It's called Mothers of Fukushima. So you'll be able to watch that now. So I want to, we, we're going to have to cut it now. I want to thank you all for